Jaz bi sakal, da počnem. Se nadam, da si da ste veliko pogoceni. Dobrodošli na današnji od Nastans. Welcome on today's event. Last from the series of events of this year. That will be on the topic of energy, democracy and energy. I will start with the uh, uh, official things. The official language is Macedonian, but we'll have simultaneous translation on both English and Macedonian for those people that do not understand one of those languages. We have interpretation on the screen. You can choose uh, which language you'd like to follow the event on. This is the technical part. The event will be uh, recorded, so if you have any questions, there's technical support, and you can send them a message. In this project, Transformation to uh, Energy Democracy, from and the foundation for Brazil is the part of the series. We are here with a lot of our friends and dear guests from different parts of the world and European Union to talk about the new directives that the energy goes. We'll talk both for pre-pandemic and the uh, pandemic and what happens right now. We'll see the trends in Europe and see trends on the future uh, possibilities, how we can go on. You'll have a lot of uh, things that you can look into. We have uh, also one publication that will be in Macedonian and I'd like to thank the uh, Green Economy Foundation, European Foundation, that also did this publication. We'll answer the question how to make a great world and how to use all the resources. We'll answer the question how to go from extractive to energy that will go on in the future. It's obvious with the climate change that are more obvious each day and other problems we have uh, in the world economies. We must have drastic uh, changes with the world and the earth and its resources. Not just now, but also for the future generations, we must use uh, the resources equally and well. Firstly, from socioeconomical reasons, we mustn't have uh, any inequality and uh, a bigger hole from those who do not use the resources and those who use them in everyday life. Historically, this always existed, but in the future, we must find a systematic change that will go on and will exist and will get us uh, social justice. On today's event, I'd like to say who are our guests. Firstly is uh, Der Holmans, co-president of GEV, Green Euro European Foundation. He's uh, also the president of Oikos Think Tank and he's the author of the publication. The original, uh, the original uh, title is uh, Introduction of Citizens' Energy, Making Energy Democracy Happen Publication. Then we have Maya Moratunin, the Green MP from the Macedonian Parliament. She'll uh, talk about her thoughts on this topic. Next, we have our Professor Bujarovsky. We thank him for being here. He's a professor of human geography at the University of Manchester, where he, uh, he leads the program of human geography. And he'll talk about uh, 
uh, energetic poverty in uh, Eastern Europe. We have Melanie Fromm. She'll talk uh, about solarization for uh, how to have clean energy transition. And at the end, we have Edwin Rejapagic. He follows our work for years. He works closely with us and uh, works on the energy part uh, of in the country for years. And he'll talk about the opportunities and challenges in renewable re renewables in the region. I'll try to be short. I'd like to present their homes, the co-president of Jeff and president of Oikos Think Tank. He'll lead us in the topic and he'll talk more about the publication right now. Here we go, Dick, you can do it to start. Okay, many thanks. Uh, it's a pleasure of being with you again. But, uh, I also want to repeat again, it's sad we are meeting by screens and not uh, coming months and then we can uh, be together again. Uh, next year, I think from the Green European Foundation, I can say we are very uh, yeah, proud on how the work you're doing in North Macedonia, uh, which is not always, uh, let's say, an easy uh, context to work in, but you really are taking on board the very progressive uh, ideas and uh, Yes, uh, working to more towards a sustainable society. So this is really a really good job you're doing. Concerning uh, the topic of today, I think it's it's a kind of a good timing you have. Uh, we are just after five years after the Paris Climate Agreement was signed, and it is clear that we all have to increase our ambitions in order to keep climate heating below the threshold of the 1.5 degrees. Um, this requires a transition of all systems that keeps our society running, mobility system, food system, but also the energy system. But, uh, and I think this is key from an ecological perspective, we just, we don't need a transition. We need a just transition. This means we take care, we don't leave anybody behind, or to put it in a more positive perspective, we have to ensure that everybody can participate and everybody can benefit from the transition. So it is not only about uh, less emissions, which of course are important, crucial, but it is also at the same time about abolishing energy poverty. It's about creating green jobs. It's also about uh, a participative democracy. So people really feel part of the change. And if we translate this to the domain of energy, in the paper, you can read that we have defined this as the transition towards a new regime of renewable energy democracy, which is based on four principles. First is evident, and I think all progressive parties uh, in society would agree on this. It's a 100% renewable energy with sun, wind and water considered as commons. Nobody owns the wind. We have to use it uh, as a commons together. The second out of four principles of this new regime of renewable energy democracy is ecological justice. Everybody has access to energy, although, and this can sound maybe a bit uh, strange, everybody has access to energy, although energy prices are high. Uh, why do I say this? Energy, also renewable energy, has a price. You have to install windmills, you have to install solar panels. This also needs materials. So we really have to be very careful about the amount of energy we need. So it's not, the good thing is not to give people money so they can pay their energy bills, although their houses are almost not insulated. The good thing is to make sure all houses are insulated, so nobody has a big energy bill. I think this is uh, the purpose, and therefore, uh, which is in a way connected to a carbon tax, 
it, we are not talking about making energy very cheap. It has to be accessible for everybody. That's the point. And we should make sure that through our provisioning systems like housing, nobody needs a lot of energy. The third principle of this new regime is democracy. Um, we have to strive for what I call a public civil management of energy production and distribution. Um, history has shown the last two, three decades in the European Union after the liberalization of the energy market in the 1990s. At that time, the illusion was that big energy corporations would take over and invest heavily in the development of renewables. And also the illusion was, or the promise was, that uh, energy invoices people have to pay would go down. Reality is that uh, also in Belgium, we have never paid more for our energy as consumers. And big corporations have barely invested in uh, renewable energy. So therefore, it is the government together with the citizens that they have to take into their own hands this uh, transition. Energy within limits, decreasing the energy demand. Um, it, is, it is always the first rule uh, if you talk about energy, the kilowatt or the watt you, you don't need, you don't use, that's the best one. So enabling a system where we can have a good life with uh, energy within planetary boundaries, within limits, is the way we have to go. So in other words, we are talking about an energy system that runs on renewable energy, is co-management, is co-managed from the standpoint of ecological justice and is focused on the general interest. Now, the good news is, and, and you will talk more about it later during this event, that next to public authorities and also the last year's corporations, citizens are organizing themselves in so-called energy cooperatives or rescopes. And they're doing it in a lot of countries and they have also organized themselves at the European level, uh, RESCO EU. And they are also very, have been influential on the European level, uh, and really were able to uh, yeah, have influence on the latest energy European energy package. So my hope is for uh, this evening, that is this, this event and this publication can inspire people in North Macedonia. Uh, actually, I know this is already happening, uh, but it can inspire even more to uh, establish risk scopes, but also to uh, think about and install legal frameworks at the national level and the municipal level in order to support these citizens energy communities and uh, in this way and that i think is the good news of the latest european energy legislation that citizens energy communities are now part of the really legal framework it's the first time and i think it's really also the first domain if you look at um, european policy that the role of citizens is directly put into legislation. And I think this is really a, a very good, uh, I would say, um, move, uh, change. And of course, if you then connect this with the European uh, Green Deal, this is really, I would say, uh, although you can criticize Green Deal, if you compare it with the policies of the former European Commission on the Juncker, this Green Deal is really a change of direction, a change of course, and as you know, also uh, the principle of just transition is part of this uh, Green Deal. Of course, there will be still a, a lot of debate on the implementation, but I think that that's normal. Transition, uh, you can also, and with this I will uh, end my uh, introduction, Another word for transition is not only change, but it's also disturbance. It's a distortion of the current system. So people who now are benefiting from the old system are in power, of course, they don't like it. So it's also, it's also a struggle uh, and there will be resistance. But I'm sure that if you work together, and uh, I would say from Brussels to Skopje, 
we can manage to really uh, make this transition a reality. So from the Green European Foundation, I wish you all the best with this event. Uh, sadly, I have to apologize. I already had uh, engaged me for another webinar which starts in 30 minutes, uh, which was already planned uh, earlier. So uh, wish you all the best and let's see each other next year uh, together with a good Belgian beer. Thank you. Ти благодарам, Дирк. На вистина благодарам. Уште еднашка сакам да заблагодарам на Зелената Европска фондација на ГЕФ. Thank you, Dirk. I would like to thank the Green European Foundation and GEF for the perfect translation in, in Macedonian that you did. And the publication is already shared uh, in PDF, you can find it in the chat. And we share the link, you can download it and uh, read it. It's a, a very simple and well, well uh, interpreted Macedonian uh, translation. You can share it with all who you feel are interested. It's address and I would like to invite uh, uh, the Member of Parliament who follows our events, Maya Muratunin, with a short view on this event. Thank you, Alexander. I'm very pleased that uh, tonight I'm, uh, I'm also a part of uh, the events of Sunrise with the support of the Green European Foundation. I hope that soon we can uh, return to organizing events in person. Uh, we have some good news in the context of uh, the availability of the vaccines. And I really hope that next year we can overcome this uh, pandemic in the crisis we are living in and we can communicate in person and share uh, experiences and ideas. Uh, it's a great news, a uh, big crisis is uh, uh, reaching its end. And uh, what's the bad news is unfortunately, uh, globally, there's a great challenge that remains the climate change. And that is something we demands from us uh, to focus and like with the corona crisis all all the states and all the institutions are focusing on cooperation that's the what i feel is the only way how we can deal with the climate crisis as well with cooperation and taking all the necessary measures to to deal with the climate change and and the climate crisis what I feel is crucial in dealing with climate change is, uh, although it's a wide topic in the context of this event, I would like to uh, address two key uh, moments, the transition from fossil fuels to renewables. And yes, I agree with Dirk the, that we need to talk about just transition, not, not just transition. It needs to be just because it's the only way how efficiently we can uh, make a transition from uh, uh, measured to the needs of the citizens and having in mind that the most vulnerable groups of citizens so uh, from social aspect especially are most affected by the climate change and the climate crisis so when we talk about transition, we always talk about just transition to renewables and maybe even widely in the wider context transition and uh, changing the economic model from the current linear to a greener circular economy. And I would agree with Dirk that that's the road that uh, 
uh, foresees a lot of obstacles because every change uh, is met with resistance. Change doesn't happen fast or easily, but together we can contribute and uh, practically make these changes happen. And of course, the second aspect is the energy efficiency, because these two elements, energy transition and to renewables and energy efficiency are uh, going hand in hand. They're a part of, of one idea. Um, the transition to renewables, uh, I want to inform you shortly that in the past three years in North Macedonia uh, uh, was made a big step in the in the legal framework in the, I'm talking about like an MP now with the new law on energy. Uh, we opened the gate for the bigger use of renewables and especially the use of solar energy is that the energy efficiency law was uh, implemented and so we have the legal background for for implementation but what remains as a big challenge The, uh, the challenge remains in the subdirectives that uh, uh, enable the, the little companies and citizens to take part in the uh, use of solar energy and to be motivated to, uh, to see it as a cost-effective way to set up photovoltaics and to take part in the market of uh, in the energy market, although it's uh, allowed, it's not motivating. The limitations that exist are, are demotivating citizens and small companies uh, to set up photovoltaics and to use solar energy. I agree that in all this process, key uh, are the benefits from the solar energy use uh, to be uh, on the side of citizens, because that, that way, uh, this way, currently the big businesses have the benefit. And that's what, what we want as the Greens is for every citizen to have the um, benefits from the renewables, the solar energy. And I feel that uh, seeing the change of uh, regulations, we should work on, on that in the next period. And uh, I think that more on this topic colleague will speak more, but as a member of parliament, I would like to contribute uh, with, uh, with my insight into the change of regulations and that it's one of the key moments to uh, make uh, solar, solar energy use more available uh, uh, for the citizens, because um, that's uh, key to the just transition that we're talking about. I will stop here because we have a, a great speakers. I feel that we will have more interesting discussion in front of us because this is a very uh, important topic uh, and, and uh, citizens are interested on this topic as well. So thank you for, for joining us all. Thank you, Maya. Well said. Shortly, you said everything that happened to us these previous years and the aspect 
that we are all talking about today and follow in this part of the economy and energy and in the future as well now. I'd like to be short as well and to say welcome to our next speaker who will talk in Macedonian. That's the Professor Stefan Bozharovsky, who is a Professor of Human Geography at the University of Manchester, where he also leads the program for people and energy at the University of Manchester as well, if I translated it right, Professor. And he is also a member of the uh, part of, for human uh, energy, and he leads the biggest network of experts for, uh, for energy poverty, and those who will lead these policies. Let's be short uh, with all the things that the professor already has done in more than 120 publications. It's a lot of uh, projects about uh, renewables. Renewable. Professor, thank you for your uh, presence. The floor is yours. Thank you. I hope you're hearing me well. Great. It's a great honor for me to be invited here and thank you for the great presentation. I'm really glad to be able to talk about these topics in Macedonia. Also, I'm very glad that I was invited by Adrian and the European colleagues whom I have collaborated with in the past and also get which I uh, you know them for a lot of time. I come from the North Macedonia from here. Right now I'm also uh, here physically, but also all uh, up until uh, my university, I studied here from a social aspect. I worked at human geography. It's kind of a, a sociology, urban sociology. I've worked that for a long time and uh, I don't know if we have enough time, but later I can show you what I've worked upon in Macedonia on this topic. My presentation is pretty much general. It's in this context that we're talking about today. The question of energy poverty and how uh, other countries in Europe treat it, what are their policies. If we have enough time, I'll show our results from our country because a few years ago, up until a few years ago, we had a big uh, project financed by European Union about the energy poverty in Skopje in some municipalities. We had a lot of reports and talked about uh, numbers of people. We also had a few workshops. So if we have time, we'll talk about that as well. Just a second, I'll share my presentation. I hope that you can see it. Actually, my presentation is uh, in English, but thank you for the flexibility to talk in Macedonian. It's more logical for me. I'll talk parallelly, but the presentation is in English. This is a presentation for the energy board in Southeastern Europe in the context of uh, generally speaking, the just energy and globally, I'll talk about the causes of this problem and how do we measure this? What are the specific uh, problems and uh, including Europe and North Macedonia as well? And then I'll talk about uh, uh, NACP 
up until July because up until a month ago, I was a president, a director of the uh, Energy Poverty Observatory of European Union that works under European Commission. So we work directly on analysis of those plans. So I'll show some of the analysis and also which are the future uh, challenges in the region and southeastern Europe. The observatory, you can find those uh, site we are in a process consortium from one to another, but you can find these uh, things. We have some indicators that are for all European countries. Not all of them are here from the Western Balkan, but if you uh, search the site, you can find them. The first indicator is the non-availability not available to hit the home to a great level. And the southeastern Europe has the highest percent to do that. The other thing is when you have errors on utility bills, including energy, Again, here on the first uh, uh, levels are the parts from Southeastern, which are which have the highest poverty levels. I'm sure that some of you know uh, the reasons why. It's not uh, something hard to know. It's prices uh, are reaching and uh, going upwards. There's a reason why under the socialism, there was uh, help from the country. It's a long story, but uh, the prices are going upward, especially of electricity, but they're also um, incoming. Uh, and it's a big reason why, but also they have low energy balance and especially what they're building in the rural areas with a low standard and uh, last uh, last ring i'd say the heat and uh, light is very expensive there are high rates of general poverty. I will explain why is there a poverty of income and energy poverty. It's not really the same. Also, the capacity of social support mechanisms in this country are not enough to cover the energy poverty uh, houses. I'm continually working in this region since 2000s from this century, and I've also worked on this topic. And I'd say that since then, it was clearly to see that the problem of energy poverty is uh, bigger than the income poverty. About two thirds of the households in North Macedonia have problems with uh, energy poverty. I'll explain why the other a problem is the limited infrastructural development and that there aren't uh, systems for heating or gas in some countries. I wouldn't like to support the gas since it's a, um, since we have the uh, bad uh, problems from it as well, but it's hard for the households to heat or to call their houses, which represents the, uh, the newer countries rather than the European countries, which usually have good infrastructural development. The transition leads uh, 
space for problems, I think it's a bad idea to put money into gas. And the other problem is uh, the inadequate political and public recognition. This is sometimes and somehow changing, but in some parts we are still uh, not on the level that we need to be at. The energy poverty can be seen, uh, it's very visible. When you, this is in Bulgaria, Krivopalnka, but when you see trees and logs, and when you can smell from houses when they heat, it's a direct, uh, direct uh, product from uh, from the heating problems and uh, we cannot uh, change this overnight since the energy poverty is uh, a problem that happens so many years so if whether we want or we don't want to uh, to accept that When we hit with logs and trees, we trigger pollution. I would like to talk about a lot of things that need to be explained. When we are talking about poverty, it's always a question of a definition in the society, which is socially and politically dependent on the context. It's not easily defined, and we cannot put it in um, a frame. It always includes participation of the society. When I define poverty, uh, it's different from the official definitions of poverty in other countries. I would say that it's a very uh, close to the definition of, of the one in France. Maybe if we can time, we can talk about this more. We talk about the inability to secure an adequate level of energy services in the home. That's the general definition. It looks uh, very simple, but we have a lot of things, but what does an adequate level mean? That's very subjective. Who says what's adequate and what's not? The adequate level has two elements. The first one is what we say, the minimal material uh, energy levels. Maybe I should have said what are, uh, what are the energy uh, needs the heat and the light, the last results that we get from the energy, that's not kilowatts or the heat through the pipes or the hot water that goes through the pipes, but the last uh, ending uh, result from what we have in our home, the benefits from the energy in our home, the usage of informatic uh, economy is the uh, uh, thing that we use, but we have the material level that we need to survive. So we can secure the health and survival. That's the minimal level. That's very well defined. If your home is under the minimal temperature from some parameters that are also uh, discussed, but at least 21 Celsius degrees uh, in winter or 18 Celsius degrees for rooms that uh, you are sleeping in. Let's talk for winter, there are different parameters for uh, summer. That's the general level. If you are a longer period of time under that temperature, there are effects on your uh, 
respiratory system and your health. If per se that level is uh, well uh, secured, it's not enough. Your needs uh, as part of the society are not all fulfilled. So if you hit only one room in your home, which is uh, very usual, do you, uh, are you part of uh, normally uh, including in the cities that, okay, if the family does not use enough uh, uh, resources since it doesn't have enough money is that living in a normal society that social socially defined level it's uh, discussable it's a question as we say for the collective uh, talk uh, socially not just economically and it depends of uh, one context to another because it's not the same in Macedonia or in Italy or in Greece or in Great Britain or in another or some countries in Africa. It's very interesting how we define this, but it's the level that we tend to minimal to uh, function normally. If you do not cover those levels, then you are uh, in an energy poverty. How many households in Europe? There are at least 50 million households that are affected. In the newest statistics are 30 to 40, but the indicators change because they uh, show different things. The uh, reasons are the low residential energy, and, uh, low incomes as i've already mentioned this turns out to earn european countries are uh, most affected what are some of the principal vulnerabilities other than the low incomes and the energy efficient low energy efficiency we talk about age the older people most usually, we also talk about gender, the households that uh, are consisted of single parents. There's a term in the Macedonian language as well, are more vulnerable. Disability is also a great vulnerability. Living in a private rented tenor that it's probably not very specifically for Macedonia, since there aren't a lot of households like this. Macedonia, we've shown also that the ethnic minority background are very vulnerable to energy poverty, and all ethnic minority are very vulnerable to this. And there are also other categories. What I would like to mention and it's really important is that the energy poverty is not the same as the income poverty. One part of those who are income poverty are uh, are also energy poor, but since we have all the other uh, vulnerabilities, we have extra households that are energy poor. If those uh, vulnerabilities are highlighted, uh, for example, in Eastern Europe, since we have bigger rate of energy poverty. In a political sense, for a long time I've spoken this and it remains the same. Now it, uh, it's getting better. It falls in uh, a hole all between everything, but historically it was a problem because it's not a problem of uh, social welfare because sometimes uh, we do not say energy poverty. It's uh, not being able to uh, to buy or uh, have something it's not sometimes falls under social welfare or energy policies which is uh, not really uh, well set in uh, south southern europe 
shortly. I wouldn't like to uh, go over my time. What are the indicators that we use? Those that I've mentioned, we have different uh, indicators. We don't have the whole picture if the only the only way to do that if we go to the household uh, to a specific household is and uh, see what are uh, what's happening there so we use general indicators so we see at uh, expenditure we uh, see and look at what the house uh, households say for themselves and their uh, signs for example if there is condensation or signs similar to, to this we are shown that something's happening there if they're cold in their house those kinds of questions are the ones that we use for a longer period of time in Estonia. I will invite you to look at uh, the overview and the report from the observatory that we've done uh, and we published a few months ago. I have also a published book. The link is at the end. So it's uh, a great uh, text to begin with and it uh, runs all the countries in Europe. Shortly, I know that we do not have enough time. Maybe we can go on with the discussion and I'll show you some uh, results about Skopje. What's the problems in Europe, including this country, firstly? I think that there are a lot of policies and formal legal documents and strategies but not uh, enough capacity implementation. Although the policy of households is not uh, well done, with, and it's very important in this sense. One thing that we can uh, change is the isolation problem and what are other things that we can learn from these uh, countries and what they can learn. They should do programs more precisely towards the energy efficiency problems in households uh, where vulnerable uh, families live. From my own experience working and uh, uh, researching this, the parts where uh, there are money put in uh, isolation, you have a huge results on the uh, end of the month uh, bills to the families, which are also which is also better for the economy, the energy, uh, and etc. There are also a lot of uh, positive sides and. All the funds from you that those countries can use. I also think that the, we should work more on um, with the ministries in these domains because they can do a lot. Because even in this sense, we have a well built system, but how we can better it in sense of energy is a different question. I'm sorry that I. Uh, went on over my time. This is the last slide that uh, repeats some of the stuff. Unfortunately, we do not have time for this, but if we have time or for while well, we have the discussion, I can go back to the results of Skopje and we can uh, talk about that. I think that's that will be interesting for you. Thank you once more. This is my Twitter. I didn't put a book, I'll write it in chat, it's in English, it's a free book, you can all open it. And per se, it has a general thing of the energy board in Europe. Thank you a lot and sorry for uh, 
uh, going over time. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the uh, exquisite presentation. This was a different uh, view. This event is fourth on this topic. Your aspect is uh, interesting in a sense that you speak uh, on the topic uh, generally uh, about energy, not just uh, uh, production and uh, the use of energy. This aspect you were presenting was very interesting and important. We can continue in the discussion. That's uh, around 40 uh, people present in, in this online conference. So to take it brief, uh, in the context that all the speakers mentioned, uh, Dirk mentioned Rescoop as a European community of uh, energy enterprises and uh, energy cooperatives. Uh, one of them is the uh, this uh, from uh, Croatia. We started the cooperation uh, last year. We continued the cooperation. I want to thank Melanie Poulan as an energy expert from this organization. And I would like to invite her as representative from the Green Energy Cooperative to present some information. Very nice introduction. Blagodaro, I'm uh, very glad to join you uh, here uh, tonight. So I have prepared a brief presentation uh, to share uh, the experience that we have uh, in Croatia with uh, community energy projects and uh, local initiatives that we initiated in the last years. Uh, so just uh, please let me know if you can see uh, the slides that I'm presenting. It should be visible now. It's okay, yeah. Okay, perfect. So uh, the topic is uh, community-led solarization for energy transition. Uh, what does that mean? So uh, I want to share with you our experience on using uh, solar PV as a technology that is already very well established and uh, to uh, boost the energy democracy process and to really bring energy in the hands of our citizens. Um, as a small introduction, uh, I want to um, tell you who we are, uh, who are, who is Zez, and uh, who are people behind the organization. Uh, we are a renewable energy uh, cooperative and uh, social enterprise. Um, we are as we are now um, uh, currently mostly active in Croatia, but uh, we had a few projects in the region, and we are very excited to continue working with, uh, with the countries in, in our neighborhood, uh, North Macedonia as well. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to continuing collaboration uh, on this field. Um, we started with a mission to help uh, public sector and citizens to invest and utilize renewable energy sources. So uh, this is the mission that we uh, have in mind from uh, the early beginnings. And uh, we are building uh, on the vision to really bring uh, uh, energy in the hands of citizens uh, through their uh, individual investments or through local energy communities and cooperatives uh, such as ours. Uh, so where we started, we started with uh, networking. Uh, with, uh, we are part of uh, uh, pretty large uh, European networks uh, that are active in this field. So uh, I uh, would like to mention some of them. Um, uh, well, uh, first, uh, the EIT Climate Kick uh, is uh, one of the Europe's largest public-private innovation uh, partnerships. And we are very proud to be part of this network and to uh, gather all, all, all the knowledge that they have and really try and implement uh, their approach in uh, combating climate change into uh, our projects in Croatia and in the region. Uh, also RESCOP EU, uh, Alexander just mentioned them. So this is a European Federation of Renewable Energy Cooperatives and we are very proud to be one of eight uh, board members um, in, uh, in, the, in the Federation. So uh, this is a huge pool of uh, inspiration and ideas 
that we are also borrowing when we are developing uh, business models that will function in our national context in Croatia. So uh, how we started, uh, well, uh, one of the first true community energy projects um, happened two years ago in Croatia and uh, uh, our cooperative was one of the in, uh, initiators. Uh, so uh, we um, designed and uh, implemented two crowdfunding campaigns uh, for uh, two uh, small scale solar PV plants uh, installed uh, on public buildings in the city of Križevci. One was for the technology center and another one for a uh, city library. Uh, this was a pretty, uh, like pretty low investment cost, uh, around uh, 30,000 uh, euros each. Uh, but what's really interesting is uh, that we managed to really activate and mobilize uh, local citizens uh, to invest and fully fund uh, the initial, the initial uh, capital to the initial investment. So we did that uh, foremost with uh, collaboration with city of Križevci. And uh, I want to uh, point out here that we are really uh, doing a lot of effort, putting a lot of effort in uh, working with the uh, local authorities in Croatia. I think this is one really uh, important segment uh, when we are talking about energy democracy and the uh, local projects and involvement of citizens. Uh, so yeah, we, what we offered for uh, local citizens in the Križevci was um, uh, 4.5 uh, uh, interest rate uh, for a period of 10 years uh, for their initial investment, for their uh, micro loan that uh, they put forward uh, to make these uh, PV plants happen. Uh, this was for the first project and for the second one uh, that followed uh, after one year or was a 3% interest. Uh, so we uh, managed to mobilize uh, more than 80 citizens from a local community and uh, the whole project was funded uh, in first case in uh, less than 10 days and uh, for the second project in less than two days. So this is something that we are especially proud of. Uh, this is our crew. Uh, uh, like uh, making a small photo session next to the PV plant. Uh, and the projects uh, that are now uh, up and running for already uh, two years on these public buildings. Um, what uh, we are now especially focused uh, are PV systems for households. So uh, what, uh, what we are working on is uh, developing a new business model that will really uh, give a boost uh, to the Croatian solar market. Uh, it's, I, I mean, the situation uh, with, the, with the market development is pretty bad in Croatia. It's mostly stagnating for, uh, for let's say, eight or, or eight or 10 months uh, within a year. And then uh, two months when, um, when there are uh, public funds, when there are uh, subsidies available for equipment, then uh, the market spikes, the market wakes up and uh, some, some systems uh, happen. But for most of the year, uh, it's really stagnating and uh, uh, we see it as a huge missed opportunity for uh, Croatian citizens uh, and for local economy. So uh, we started in 2019 uh, with collaboration with City of Varazin and this is now uh, our new demo uh, place to really uh, test and uh, test the business model that we developed and to really implement uh, uh, 30 small scale um, PV systems for households uh, in their local community. So uh, what, what was really interesting is uh, that uh, in the midst of a uh, pandemic, pandemic going on and uh, uh, starting to roll out, uh, we um, made a small survey uh, for uh, Croatian households and uh, they showed a really huge interest to, in the times of crisis, put their money in something uh, that will uh, secure benefits for them in the coming period of 20 to 30 years. Um, in, uh, in June in June this year, uh, we received grant uh, from EIT Climate Kick uh, through their extraordinary post COVID-19 regeneration call so uh, we uh, really put uh, solar and its potential to uh, boost a local community and to provide uh, new green jobs, uh, to uh, provide a new perspective uh, for unemployed uh, young people who lost, uh, who lost their job uh, during uh, 
during the crisis. We really put that in the center of the solution that we were offering. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it was really um, amazing to work on this in the next, uh, in the following uh, six months with our colleagues from EIT Climate Geek. Uh, they uh, recognized us uh, this week as uh, one of uh, their uh, champions uh, in 2020, and we are very proud of that. Uh, so, uh, so what is it all about? So we um, recognized uh, three main issues that we want uh, to solve uh, with the solar energy in the hands of citizens. And this is a job loss uh, that uh, people suffer. And uh, this is a really low PV penetration uh, in the energy mix in Croatia. So uh, we are among uh, uh, the worst countries in, in the EU uh, like with the uh, utilization of the potential that we have. And uh, we uh, saw like that cities are very vulnerable to lockdowns and especially because they depend on, uh, on imports uh, in all segments. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an engineer, so I want to put some uh, numbers forward here as well. So uh, what would uh, 1000 solar roofs mean in the Croatian context? Uh, it would uh, be just, just a beginning, just a small boost uh, to the market that is right now uh, dead. Uh, this would uh, mean only 15% of the goal that is set with the energy strategy of Croatia um, each year. And uh, uh, it would uh, uh, attract initial investment of up to 8 million euros, which is great. And uh, which would uh, actually uh, boost, like, uh, boost economy on a larger scale. And it would uh, create the potential uh, to have uh, up to 4,000 new green jobs every year. So what are the key elements of this model? It's, uh, we want to build a whole ecosystem around the solar PV market. We are focusing on local partnerships. We also attracted some commercial partners uh, like uh, Raiffeisen Bank. And we, were, uh, we will uh, continue working on that hard uh, in the following months and uh, next year. So we, we developed a digital tool, a uh, matchmaking platform, uh, which I will uh, present uh, really uh, briefly uh, in a couple of minutes. So uh, what we're also uh, working on is uh, strengthening uh, local communities. So uh, we developed an education module for solar installers, uh, which will become ambassadors of the business model that we've developed, ambassadors of community energy uh, and, uh, and uh, energy cooperatives. And uh, we are right now uh, in the middle of testing this uh, new business model with the new capacity being installed in city of Varaždin. Uh, it all started at uh, the community mobilization campaign started in September this year. So we visited 10 Croatian cities. This was a really important step for us because we uh, really went out there and make interaction with uh, more than 500 people in uh, Croatian city squares. Uh, to answer all the questions that they had uh, regarding the solar PV. And uh, in October, we launched the platform, Nasunčanoj Strani, or on the sunny side, uh, which is actually one-stop shop for our uh, new customers. So this is, uh, this is the model that we developed is uh, market-based. And uh, we see this as an opportunity for us as a cooperative to really uh, come out on the market and uh, uh, provide an alternative to the uh, services that are right now being offered, uh, which are not really creating a big impact on the, on the uh, penetration levels or on the climate or energy goals that the uh, Croatian government set. Uh, so what else? Uh, we, are, uh, we will offer group discounts uh, to our customers, and this is an alternative to uh, government subsidies that are pretty hectic and unstructured in Croatia at the moment. Uh, we will also um, uh, match make our customers with optimal technical solution, uh, which uh, fits their needs. And we will uh, continue working on empowering local communities. So this is uh, to sum it up maybe in two points. So what, so what the citizens get is uh, uh, an opportunity to join uh, to uh, join first cooperative procurement procurement of solar PV systems in Croatia, and to really get full technical and administrative support that uh, they told us they need 
uh, through a service that we made and uh, through uh, local uh, community activation activities that we had really in the field in the uh, 10 cities that we visited. So these are some of the tools, a calculator uh, that we designed uh, where people can check uh, what, what system uh, would fit uh, their house, their home. Uh, we also started with a solar, uh, solar phone uh, where they can uh, call us and access all the information they need uh, practically immediately and for free. Uh, as I mentioned before, we are really focusing on building strong partnerships and uh, strong local collaborations. So we are especially counting there on um, the local governments that we are working with. Uh, with uh, some other projects that uh, are now running. And we are also teaming up with uh, commercial partners. Today, this is a uh, Raiffeisen Bank and tomorrow, I'm sure there will be more of them uh, supporting us on uh, to reach our goal of uh, 1000 uh, small scale uh, PV systems installed in, uh, for households in Croatia. Uh, so far, uh, um, after five weeks of uh, communication campaign on uh, social media and uh, in, uh, in this classical media, we got almost uh, 600 uh, expressions of interest from citizens. And most of them are already done with all the technical checks that we um, are providing for them for free. And uh, the thing that follows is uh, to uh, provide them uh, opportunity to, you know, really part of, to really become part of first procurement uh, in the next few months. So what's next uh, in, uh, in this particular project that uh, we are running? It's a continuation of the community mobilization activities. Uh, this is especially something that is very important for us. We really want to be in touch with the citizens. So even though we are a small cooperative, we are only 20 people, we really want to make uh, this uh, movement to include as many citizens as possible and they are active on the national scale. So what we are doing also is uh, uh, steps towards more digitalized process. We also want to expand the network of our partners. Uh, we will have a first, uh, first demo, first installations uh, uh, by the end of this year. So this is already in, in progress. Uh, we will build a virtual renewable energy community. Um, uh, we will manage to do that uh, thanks to the funds from EU projects. So we are now uh, currently involved in almost 10 EU projects. And I must say that this was a huge, uh, this is a really a huge uh, boost for our cooperative to start uh, to make uh, uh, marketable solutions. And of course there are some uh, uh, regulatory changes that need to happen to really make uh, energy democracy like a, a full blast in Croatia. We also see a uh, replication potential of our model uh, in Macedonia and uh, in South uh, East uh, Europe. So uh, what uh, I think is really important from the model and I summarized here and uh, it's necessary to make the uh, make this kind of uh, business model work uh, in your countries uh, is uh, to have a community on board to collaborate with local uh, authorities to start and uh, encourage local energy communities and to also to advocate for the regulatory changes. So this is something that all of us needs. That's it. I hope I was on time. Thank you very much, Melanie. This was another aspect, a view uh, from the energy cooperatives. What is uh, good uh, is that in Croatia, these energy cooperatives function several years in Croatia. Uh, what Melanie's presentation showed a lot of information will stick with me for a while. Uh, but what uh, Professor Bujarski showed was very, very um, real. Uh, view of Macedonia, but uh, both of them can can uh, help us uh, and the new uh, uh, legislation will, will uh, enable us to act like uh, some colleagues in the European Union and implement these models in our country. 
tonight with us is also uh, like we've done in every uh, every uh, action on energy democracy uh, uh, someone who works on this topic for years uh, Ervin Rege package and he will address us with the new, new developments да, here ти, and in the world. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you. 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 Кои се начините или поточно че на начините на експлоатација на таа енергија? Уште поважно кои се проблемите со кои што ќе се соочат и дилемите кои што ќе ги имаат при одлучување дали и како ќе инвестираат во тоа. И на крај најважно ќе се потрудам да дам овај свои видувања на проблемите и решенија кои на средовечен план би требало да бидат ефективни и практично овој дел од пазара да го да го бустираат за да и ние можеме како хрватска еве да да почнеме помасно да инвестираме во обновени визори. Прв начин како ќе може да инвестира тоа е да не зависи од големината на инсталацијата, дали е еден или еден панел. експлоатацијата на таа енергија да биде само за нивните потреби. Тоа значи дека ниту нема да има добра точка со со мрежата, се што ќе произведат ќе треба да го потрошат. И доколку им зафали ќе нема енергија. И сега тука влагаат се влегуваат плус системи како интелегентна автоматика и патери, зари тоа што во лето ќе се повеќе енергија, во зима ќе им фали, ќе мора тоа да го балансираат. И во суштина тој систем за единици и за потувачи кои што се приклучени на мрежа, не е ретабил. Дали имаме такви апликации на нас? Има. И тоа се обично куки кои се забачени по планина негде, или се викендици, кои не се големи потушуваци, и на кои има многу по-скапо да донесат рафа паница и да приклучат на потушач на мрежа, и се обичуваат на овој тип на инвестици. Втор начин како може да инвестираат, тоа е да инвестираат повторно колку панели се граѓат, од една панели или еден килова панели се граѓат. И целата енергија да се труда да ја продадат на тој со новиот закон за енергетика, може поединец или правен субјект да продава пазар на лична енергија, на слободен пазар, без никакви субвенции или без било какви ренчува. Тука не е рентабилно за помали централи, да речеме, од 200 кВт, што значи дека отпаѓа моментот дека поединци може да инвестираат на своите колови на своите куќи. Тоа се обично големи централи, сега скоро знаете дека стајќе беше во Ботино, се сход при нова централа на Еван Ботино, да е Таа оди на Слободен пазар, и ја продаваа таа струја на Слободен пазар и во одрен дел од годината да се држава таа отвара на лотови на на субвенционирана енергија и тука се тие тие преми на каде што тие тие централи аплицираат и по систем на подавање добиваат некаква дона субвенција од државата таа конкретно централа на ЕВН е дори субвенција од 14 евра по мега тоа се не значи ништо ама е е некаков си буст за за самата електрична и трет на кој што граѓаните може да инвестираат а тоа на воведен со новиот закон за енергетика и требаше да да ја умасови да инвестиција од 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 граѓаните е практично хибрид по меѓу овие два во првиот да повторам само трошка за себе во вториот само продавате 
just for themselves, and the second one uh, just to sell it, and the third one you produce and use as much as you need, and uh, take the, the energy left, you sell it, or if you miss some, you buy from the operator, it sounds great in theory, but in practice there are problems. I'll try to explain those problems to you. And they'll try to find uh, solutions for that. The first problem they'll face with the potential investor is what Maya already mentioned. There are limits to the power plants and those maybe aren't the biggest reasons, but the second and I would say biggest problem is the double taxation. Instead of leaving the money to the citizens, the country can't recognize those citizens there are consumers, but as well the producers, so the country can't recognize them and double uh, taxate them. For those who do not know, what consists uh, the market? The market is consisted of uh, the producers, the suppliers and the distributors and the consumers. So the consumer is uh, problematically recognized as a producer, it's uh, double taxated and it's a problem that must be eliminated from those robots. Secondly, it's interesting how the law works Kuakupuate uh, then you're paid for another one. Uh, it's another way of motivation uh, for these types the system input must be what is energy because we use the stock exchange and they go to Hungary and to Macedonia, so we uh, also pay payroll for this uh, energy. And another 
И четвърт проблем, проблем е това е решение в Бойкет. Повие снабдувачи е, кога гласира енергията на потрошувачите преко дистрибутивния систем, се обръзвани 10% от енергията, што ја купуваат, ја пасираат на пазарот, да ја купуваат од обновливи извори на енергија. Па, значи дека обновливи извори ќе нојдат на свој пазар, за да бидат пасират. Но, има една самка тука. Тоа дека во сите 10% посто, и најголем делот 10% посто, се енергијата е изведено од мали хидроекрани. Бидејќи во последно време да ме прашавте и мен и сите што ја во секторот до 3-4 години, дали малите хидроелектрани се обнови на енергија, ќе кажат ми сите сложно да. Очигледно дека многи студи можеба дека енергија. Секој хипотетички би извадиле од тие 10% енергијата кој изведено од мали хидроелектрани. Ние прво ќе ја намалиме мотивацијата да се инвестира во мали хидроелектрани, А ќе ја зголемиме мотивацијата, бидејќи во 10% мора да има овај побарувач на сунцината и ќе зголемиме и ќе ги инвестираме инвестициите во токму, во сонце и во ветер. Мислам дека од прилика тоа има уште мал милион работи, ама мислам дека конечно сме на прав пат, ама имаме уште много да изгледуваме. Мислам дека исто така, како што реков, на макро ниво би трябва да ги решим прво проблемите, за да можем да се спочнем. Микроливо и се надам дека во близки дни на какво го трябва се ќе можем и ние тука да имаме такви инвестиции, како да е што така да ги можем да ги инвестираме, да бидат дел от тој екосистем, како сапотрошувачи, as consumers as well as producers, prosumers. Ви благодарам на помните. Се надавам дека ве се потрудив да објаснам. Се надавам дека нема што нови технички работи. Ви стоја на разполагање на делаги. Ви значи би сакал да кажам на сите присутни, Слободно во чат ќе ја најдете публикацијата на Дирк Холеманс и на Кати Вандевелде о Зелената Европска фондација. Може би и таа ќе ве воведе понатаму. Да почнете да се интересирате, да се интересирате за темата, може би да истражувате малце повеќе. Дирк имаше кратко излагање, мислам дека беше јасен. Исто професорот значи многу а, ни наметна една еден друг аспект што јас цело време го говорам дека енергијата не е електрична, дека таа е енергија во што земено така треба да ја гледаме. Да. А, исто така и а, и Мелани а, ни даде еден инсайт а, на некој што веќе ги почнал да ги води оние први чекори во ова во овој дел. Значи се надам дека Македонија ќе биде следна во регионот што ќе ги води тие чекори кон енергетска демократија и ерви го слушаме на крај сите знаеме што кажа. And we have listened to at the end. We all know what uh, he said. Now I'm calling all of you to participate in discussion. Maya is the first one. Your the floor is yours. Thank you, Atsa. Yes, as I said uh, in the first part, I knew that uh, the presentations will be very interesting, and the topic is very interesting. The discussion as well. I would uh, ask one question to Melanie, since I'm directly uh, in, into bettering uh, this regulative, uh, what Arvin said, what's our situation? Do you have any information how in Croatia is this uh, solved? Is there a double taxation? How do they go over it and how do they solve those solutions with capacity of the network. So we can use some positive uh, things and use them here. So we can use a positive uh, example. Thank you, Maya, for the question. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I understood everything correctly, but I will try to answer. And if I go in the wrong direction, just uh, um, bring me back, back to the right path. 
So uh, regarding the uh, legislation that is uh, currently um, uh, uh, on spot in Croatia, so uh, we have a, a law that uh, is allowing citizens to become prosumers to use their own electricity that they produce from the PV systems installed uh, in their uh, rooftops and uh, using the electrical grid uh, let's say as a, as a battery on a monthly basis. So it's a, a, in a, on a monthly scope, it's a net metering, but on a yearly scope, it's a net billing because uh, if you, uh, over, if you uh, feed too much of the electricity uh, that you produced into grid on the end of the month, uh, it will be transferred to uh, the next month uh, with a factor of 0 0.8. So it's not one for one. But it's still, it's still a pretty good model uh, compared to what we had uh, before 1st of uh, January 2019. So this is now a huge improvement and a huge boost uh, for citizens uh, to, uh, to really make a, make a step forward uh, and uh, really decide to invest in solar PV. And according to our calculations, uh, thanks to this model, they can, uh, if we are talking about uh, uh, like a average uh, Croatian household uh, that uh, is uh, spending up to 5,000 kilowatt hours uh, per year. They, they need, uh, let's say, a small system of uh, five kilowatts and uh, the investment uh, will be returned uh, to them uh, within uh, six to eight years, depending on their location and the specific uh, of the of the object, uh, the, spe the specific of their house and the specific of the uh, geographical uh, position. So, so I would say that the legislation that we have now is not perfect, uh, but it's following European trends and it's much better than it's been before. Um, that's that's one part. And on the other part, uh, regarding uh, the recognition of energy communities in our legislation. That unfortunately is not happening yet. So uh, at the moment, uh, there is uh, this uh, transposition of um, renewable energy directive in place, but it's not, uh, it's not fully uh, implemented yet. And uh, at the moment, we don't have the term of energy community recognized in our laws. So because it's not even recognized or introduced, the, the energy communities don't get any kind of uh, recognition of additional benefits uh, regarding, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, tax, uh, taxation exemptions so, or, or any other for that matter. But we are working on that and we are really hoping that from uh, 2021 we will have the energy communities uh, defined really clearly in our legislation. Yes, thank you, Melanie. Uh, yes, uh, I, that was the, the answer I needed actually <laughs> yeah, for, the, for the legislation. Uh, I thought that uh, you, you have a legislation for energy community in Croatia, but okay, yes, the, the, that is a process also. No, we, we also don't have uh, energy cooperatives recognized as a, as a true legal form. We have cooperatives and that's it. And we just added the word energy cooperatives and adjusted our, our business model to, to concentrate, to really focus on renewable energy. But we are just a cooperative as any yeah. other. Uh, yeah, that is very creative. Yeah, we, we could use that, <laughs> that, that uh, way also. Thank you, Melan. Uh, and we can have a successful story that we can present if we have uh, tax benefits or but it will be a practical presentation um, that can be offered to the uh, municipalities as a solution they can implement on a on a short term on a long term uh, we have uh, a lot to work <inaudible> It's a logical idea. Uh, I have a question. I, it's interesting what uh, Angushev uh, put a question. It's very uh, summing up all the presentations, but I want to add up something. Uh, I follow this from Croatia, uh, closely uh, follow their, their steps. And an interesting aspect that uh, lingers through their project and uh, activities they they implement 
they have in one project financing of the cooperative uh, but they set up the the uh, cooperative as a solar uh, uh, panel on a school uh, they, they want to give money to the um, municipality and they have uh, uh, return investments and uh, the, the, from the from the municipality and the solar uh, photovoltaics stay for the school to use them for years and uh, this is an interesting experience from Croatia. I want to ask Melanie to explain this model to us. I want to, uh, so we can see a solution in the region. Uh, of course, yeah. So uh, this is uh, our work uh, of where we collaborate with uh, public buildings, uh, with local authorities in Croatia. Uh, so, uh, uh, what is in the like? What is the highlight of our model? Uh, it's uh, uh, crowd investing. So it's activating uh, local citizens uh, to put money uh, to uh, in, to fund the capital investment to get the equipment to get the solar PV equipment that will be installed for the public building that will use this electricity. And uh, the final user of this electricity is uh, the building in um, uh, in ownership of the of the local authority. So it, it, it's a school, or uh, in uh, in this case in Križevci, it's a public library. So uh, what they do is uh, they um, uh, uh, they secures uh, like some defined amount of savings, energy savings that they will achieve every year. And for that amount of savings, they uh, give us uh, like money that we use to give back uh, initial investment to the investors. So we are actually here acting as a mediator from the citizen who want to invest in their local project. And uh, the final user or local authority and the building uh, owned by local authority that will be the final user of the electricity that is produced. So um, this is something that we implemented two years ago and we are look really looking for, we, we had uh, three projects like this uh, so far that are up and running and uh, the, it really attracted a huge interest from, uh, from citizens. Uh, so that was that was really great for us. We uh, we had to upgrade our model because uh, unfortunately uh, we uh, we cannot. Um, it's not uh, very marketable for us as a cooperative. So uh, we are uh, there investing our own resources that we get from EU funds, uh, but it's very difficult uh, because of the market uh, specifics in Croatia to uh, make money out of it because we would need to be registered as uh, energy suppliers. And uh, like this, it's a, it's a really great story. It's something that we want to replicate, uh, but we are still continuing to look for a model that will be uh, really uh, you know, market-based uh, for us. So we are turning also to collaboration with uh, private buildings as well. Even though we will continue working with uh, public authorities, even though it's uh, there's no much money for us there. Yeah. Thank you, Melanie. So there are other models. What Alexander mentioned, I want to compare something with if you want a uh, photovoltaics or, or uh, water heating system on the household and from the savings to pay the, the interest, uh, that's the goal how we can uh, reach uh, mass produ production of energy, of solar energy. Any other questions uh, from Miroslav Bogdanovsky? I have a question for Professor Bujarovsky. Since the city of Skopje is one of the most polluted in Europe, uh, there are interesting data uh, he mentioned and if he can present them to us. Of course, I opened the file, so I will share it for you. Yeah, 
imamo jedna statija, nekoliko statija me napišeno, ili samo ovak ja pokažem imena. We have a few research articles. This is one about the cooling in summer, but this one is more about the heating. It was a research, a big panel of research of 600 households in two parts of Skopje, in the area of Bunjakovic, in the municipality of Centar, and in Chair, Železara and Gazibova municipalities. It ended up in 2011 and it had detailed qualitative research with the households and uh, interviews etc just in in brief uh, what the specifics of these two parts are because we compared uh, other uh, bigger and uh, richer uh, cities uh, prague in poland and budapest The first thing was that uh, households that were in, in the municipality of Chire in that area were uh, poor households with a lot of problems and uh, a lot of issues with energy uh, poverty, 40% of uh, humidity and uh, what we discussed, they had a lot of mold in the households as well. Uh, record levels of uh, reduction of uh, all uh, possibilities of electrical uh, facilities, water, uh, light, etc. Uh, we we uh, made a lot of kind of logistical regressions uh, when you see the influences. Uh, what was interesting in the central part of Skopje, one of the Uh, main variables was the income. It showed there was a problem and uh, and uh, central heating system. Uh, and in Skopje Sever municipalities where if you're uh, connected uh, connected to the uh, thermal heating, uh, uh, then you have uh, higher electrical bills. As well, we we viewed uh, those that uh, showed they have problem with the heating. The main factors were uh, the number of uh, rooms in the household, the the income, and the uh, number of members in the household. It also showed if they were uh, connected to the uh, central heating grid. This is not the case in the other central parts of Skopje. I will give you a link to the to the survey and to the to the analysis. And in general, there was a lot of things that surprised us in that sense. And we did, it's because we didn't expect that uh, a big issue would be, uh, especially in some municipalities like Skopje, Sever and Železara, where there's a huge percent of energy poor households and as a whole in the whole uh, uh, household community, residential community. I will forward the links to you. Thank you, Professor. They'll, we would like to read the survey and the research. Your aspects are very interesting for me. You've researched very deeply. We don't have that in our country, and uh, those would be most helpful for us in the future. If there's another question, I would ask from the present people here. Okay. Then I would continue with the uh, closing of the discussion with a sincere wish 
since our speakers were extraordinary today and spoke about uh, very big topics. I would like to continue the collaboration in the future and all of the people present here today to feel free to talk to us. We'll be here for any further questions on this uh, topic. We are staying in contact from the chat. I'll save all the publications and I'll make sure to send them to all the participants on the mails left. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you for your presence, both to the participants and the speakers. And I hope that uh, very uh, nearly we'll see each other again. I wish you a great evening. Goodbye.